Welcome back to the Break Hard Podcast. My name is Matt. Yes, I know. Last week I said I was going to work at getting a co-host on here, or at least some sort of rotating co-host. I traveled for most of last week. I'll get into that in just a second. So I wasn't really able to put that together for this week. Thank you to all the people that reached out, sent over some demo tapes. I will get back to you uh, at some point, hopefully this week. Uh, definitely this week. I'll make that happen uh, so we can maybe try to get something going there other than me just talking for 20 to 30 minutes here. But this past weekend, I traveled down to Greensboro, North Carolina and did live television for the first time. I was a uh, guest analyst on the Mav TV GAA Classic Car Auction, got up on the block, talked some car cars with Ryan Newman and Matt Yoakum. Both of those guys could not have been nicer, could not have been more welcoming. Uh, for me, it was the first time ever doing live TV, so it was a bit of a learning curve for sure. Uh, on Friday, definitely not as comfortable as I was on Saturday. Uh, I'm my own toughest critic, so I rewatched it a couple of times, and I, I just wish you could go back and redo a couple of things, but, you know, it's live TV. It happens. Hopefully, I get another opportunity in the future. Definitely felt way more comfortable on Saturday than I did on Friday, but it is very surreal to hear Bob Varsha say your name uh, on the broadcast in your ear uh, as, a, as a guy that grew up watching Formula One during the speed days. 2001 was really the first time I fully watched a full Formula One season. My dad w- waking me up at 6 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning to go watch him. Bob Varsha was the voice of Formula One for me as a kid, uh, for a majority of it at least. And it was surreal to hear him say my name, which was awesome and, and everything that went into it. But watching how a live production, uh, live broadcast works from the production trailer was absolutely eye-opening to me. And maybe I won't be as critical about the Fox broadcast as much at times, but it is incredibly cool to be associated with. If you're in the market for a classic car or a performance car, car in general, check out GAA because that whole facility down there that they refer to as the Palace in Greensboro is Nothing short of phenomenal. The staff is great. The facilities are top notch. There's eight acres of of warehouse, essentially, where all the cars are underneath one roof. You can walk through, do a preview day. I believe if you're not bidding, you can go and just enjoy. It's a car show, essentially, uh, for $20, which is a steal. And everything there is, like I said, top top notch. It's a great... Great uh, great facility, great event, great everything involved, so I can't say enough good things. I also went to Bowman Gray Stadium while I was down there. We'll get to NASCAR in just a second here. Uh, yeah, went to Bowman Gray Stadium. First time I've ever seen a race live there. I've seen the track uh, before when I was passing through. Saw a race there for the first time. They were ran ten, uh, twin 25 lappers for the Modified Series, for the Sportsman Series as well. And it was exactly what I expected out of Bowman Gray. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Bowman Gray Stadium, if you haven't been, feels a lot like a high school football game in a small town. Everybody's there. It You can definitely tell that for a lot of people, this is a regular Saturday night thing. There's kids walking around. There's groups of kids walking and, and talking. Everybody kind of has their own little cliques. They're all running off with their friends. It had a very much small town high school football game feel to it, which was great. Probably about fourteen to 15,000 people packed in there. Everything about getting in to the track was great. It was seamless. Bought my tickets online, walked up to the gate, lady scanned it, ride in. Concessions on either end of the stadium, great concessions, great bathrooms, tons of options in terms of food from local vendors as well. My only knock on the whole experience was I wish they had more Bowman Gray merchandise to purchase. I was ready to buy a Bowman Gray shirt with the you know traditional Bowman Gray logo on it or a hat or something along those lines. Couldn't find it. And if I'd missed it, I'm upset about that now. So if you know in the comments that, you know, that's a... Uh, There's a spot to do that. Let me know, because if I have to go back or am I back in the Greensboro Winston-Salem triad area, as they refer to it, learn that this weekend. I'd love to grab one while I'm there. But Bowman Gray, first race of the night uh, for the street stock, I believe a street stock or or whatever it was. Uh, leader gets moved on the last lap in turn four, banging doors down the backstretch after the race, uh, gets out and people are booing, yelling. It was everything you could possibly want. And I, I loved every second of it because it's so, it's so just out of my normal realm of, of things that I do, racetracks that I, I go to. And yeah, it's Bowman Gray. There's children leaning over the wall, flipping off other cars, people just yelling obscene things at uh, some of these drivers uh yeah it's the madhouse is what it is moving on to racing this weekend we had the nascar cup and xfinity series at dover we had indycar down at barber we'll get to indycar in a second which might honestly be the biggest portion of the show because everything's happened in indycar 
For the Cup Series, Denny Hamlin picks up his third win of the season. He leads 136 of the 400 laps. We have seven drivers lead over 30 laps, which honestly, that's a good thing. That's a step in the right direction. Unfortunately, the race is going to be marred by all this talk about aero blocking, about mirror driving, and you know the final laps where Kyle Larson caught the 11 of Denny Hamlin but could not get around him, which is a thing that we see with this car. Kyle Busch said that this car has better defense than it does offense. Essentially saying that this car is great at blocking and defense wins championships and air blocking is exactly what you have to do in this car. And this isn't a new thing. People are going to be complaining about it. It's going to be the hot topic issue. I'm sure that the people over at SiriusXM NASCAR will field a number of highly intelligent calls this week about it. But this has been around for a long time. And maybe we've just referred to it as something different in the past. You know, think about, you know, 20 years ago, Jeff Gordon was doing this in the Gen 4 car. Yeah, and they used to refer to it as, oh, he's taking his line away. And essentially what he was doing is was doing just that. He saw that the car behind him was catching him by running the high line or running the bottom line. And then they would move up or down and take away that line and essentially put the car behind them in dirty air. We just maybe didn't understand it the same way that they do now. And Chris Gabehart, Danny Hamlin's crew chief after the race, mentioned just that. He's like, if these guys would have known how to do this 10 years ago, they'd have been doing it then. He's like, they just really understand how to do it now. And we saw Kyle Larson do it at Las Vegas earlier this year with Tyler Reddick. And he mentioned that in his post-race comments as well. He said one thing that he thinks could, you know, help make the situation a little bit better is by taking the rearview cameras out of the car, which, of course, debuted with the Gen 7 car. I don't know if that's going to fix it. Not 100% sure that's the right answer there, because ultimately you still have a rearview mirror and you can obviously see what's happening. You also have a spotter up there as well. Landon Castle had a controversial tweet after the race where he said that he wouldn't mind seeing the spotters be limited on the amount of information that they can give the driver. And I don't disagree with that, but of course... Bert and Fredward over at DBC had to come out and get all slobber mouth like they always do. And, you know, oh, we're the without us, drivers wouldn't be able to win races. Okay, whatever. I'm not going to get into that right now because the two, the two red faced guys just are going to get on there and get red faced about nonsense once again. So, whatever. They can think what they want. At the end of the day, yeah, defense with this car has become the best offense for it. And defense wins championships, and Denny Hamlin, and anybody that gets out front now knows exactly what to do with the air. Denny Hamlin wins the race, his third of the season, ties him now with the most wins this season with William Byron through the first 11 races. Those two guys are on absolute heaters. I mean, every race outside of Atlanta and Talladega have been won by either a Hendrick car or a Joe Gibbs racing car, which is... Cream rises to the top, right? The parity with the Gen 7 car is essentially gone. The top teams have once again figured out how to make this car better than everybody else. And that's what we always knew was going to happen. Unfortunately, these cars are so similar between teams that the speed is just kind of all the same. And it makes passing really, really hard. Ford has now gone winless through the first 11 races. Noah Gragson was the highest finishing driver in six. They also... Um, Got Ryan Blaney in the top 10 as well with a 7th place finish. Daniel Hemrick manages to work some pitch strategy. Got a caution. Gets a top 10 finish out of the day. Both of the call cars in the top 13 with AJ Allmendinger finishing 13th. Really good run for, for them. Hendrick Motorsports looked like they were going to have all four cars maybe in the top 5, top 6 for, for the day. William Byron gets caught up in a wreck after getting marred back in traffic because his car fell off the jack. Highly unfortunate time for, for them. They had a hard time getting that car back up off the ground to get the jack underneath it. Alex Bowman showed great speed on Sunday as well, and I know the mouth-breathing portion of the fan base is going to still say that he needs to be replaced. Four top tens, six, uh, or four top fives, six top tens on the season already through the first 11 races. The guy's doing just fine. Was running P2 at one point on speed. Ends up finishing uh, P8. Just kind of lost track position there. Couldn't get it back. He did have a run in on pit road, which I'm sure will be talked about this week as well, where he's running the basically the middle lane of pit road. Kyle Larson's against the wall to his right, and then Denny Hamlin comes out of his pit and basically creates an Alex Bowman sandwich. Bowman then sarcastically thanks the five car on pit road, to which his spotter responded and said, you know, basically, they're not going to just pull over for you, dude. Like, it's a race. Okay, it's a little aggressive for your driver. And then they go back and forth, and his spotter's telling the crew chief, basically, like, it's an effing race, got to go out there and win it type of thing. And the guy's a teammate. Like, he's just not going to you know give in to you and then bowman responds with just shut the f up and let me drive the car so yeah it was aggressive and they seem to be friends off track i'm sure they'll work through it but that'll definitely be something that people will talk about 
this week as well. Overall, this race had a couple of natural cautions. You had Brad Keselowski on a weekend where he was like, oh, yeah, I can't imagine somebody else driving my car. It'd probably be a lot like watching somebody sleep with my wife. Okay, that's aggressive and a heck of a comparison, but go off, Brad. And then you had David Todd, Gil- David, Todd, Todd Gillen. Get the Gillens mixed up. It's like Aaliyah and Ashanti for me. Constantly getting those two mixed up in my head. One's alive, one's dead. Todd and David, both very much alive. Todd is in the Cup Series, though. His dad runs Tricon Garage. Bizarre. Okay. Yes, Ty Gillen ends up getting wrecked. Ricky Sinhouse as well. Ryan Priest caught on fire because, once again, the Fords have seemingly not figured out why the Rockers keep catching on fire. He was not happy about that, and he shouldn't have been happy about it. And then at the end of the race, towards the end of the race, rather, we had... um, a uh, typical Dover incident coming off of turn two. Zane Smith turns the 23 of Bubba Wallace, uh, who then slides back down the track. William Byron runs over the 20 car of uh, Christopher Bell, spins him out, and then Byron runs right into the 23 of Bubba Wallace, basically ruining the day for all three cars. And Zane goes on to finish 24th, which honestly is not that bad for how poorly that team has run at times this year. Overall, it was an okay race. I think I gave it like a 70. It wasn't the best. wasn't the worst. I called it the Eric Amarola of races. You know it existed. Not much, uh, not many memorable things happened from it. You did have passing, right? Kyle Larson did drive from 21st up to 2nd. Chase Elliott drove from 29th up to 5th. You had fast cars that could make moves. But ultimately, there were on-track passes for the lead. I'll give it that but they mostly came with the aid of a lap down car. We saw it happen perfectly with William Byron. He caught the 99 of Daniel Suarez, couldn't figure out how to get around him. And then Martin Drex Jr. got around him for the lead. So there were some things, but ultimately the tire still needs to wear out a bit more. On Saturday, they saw some courting and I was like, oh man, maybe we're going to get like a Bristol type of race here. And then it got warm. And unfortunately they couldn't replicate the same thing. If the track, if the ambient air temperature is cooler, the track temperature is cooler, it seems like you're going to get a courting you know, issue kind of like what we saw at Bristol back in the fall or back in the spring. But if the track's warmer, you're not going to get that same issue. So Goodyear and NASCAR have to kind of figure out what's going to work the best there. Yeah. At the end of the day, it was, it was an okay race. Corner speeds, like I said, still too high, still need some tire fall off, but it's kind of just gen seven on par for the gen seven car at Dover at this point. Which isn't good or bad. I'm just saying that's kind of what it is at this point. You also had the Fox broadcast on Sunday. And I'm, for once, probably not going to be that critical of the broadcast. A couple things. One, cameraman Mitch. During the live shot of Larry Mack, Mitch is in the background. You can see all the mon- You can see on the monitor uh, the shot from each cameraman. Mitch is just zooming in on a trio of ladies up in the stands. You got to chill out, Mitch. You just can't do it. Can't do that, man. You can't let the invasive thoughts win, and he, and he did. So didn't, <laughs> that went viral. Not not ideal. The two most viral moments of the weekend for motorsports was Mitch zooming in on the trio of ladies up in the grandstand and the mannequin falling at IndyCar. Not about the on-track product, which is unfortunate. And then you also have the booth. Mike Joy used to be great. He's made some mistakes uh, more prevalently over the last couple of years. And on Sunday, he, when talking to Eric Jones, was like, oh, this is Corey Heim. He's subbing for the injured Eric Bell. Not sure who Eric Bell is. Still waiting to figure that one out. But Corey Heim was substituting for him. Maybe he's made some championship four appearances. Maybe he hasn't. Maybe he's won the Southern 500. Who knows? But it, Eric Bell on track. And then during the big wreck where Zane Smith turned the 23 above Bubba Wallace, the booth just could not figure out who had spun him. They were like, oh, William Byron spins a 23 car. Oh, Alex Bowman's collected it in as well. No, at no point did either of those things happen. And I saw somebody be like, they're watching on a small monitor at the track. Give them a break. At that point, I was watching the race on my phone, and I knew what happened. I could see it on this. iPhone 15 Pro, not the Max, not even the big one. Standard size. So, yeah, that was frustrating as well because it was Christopher Bell that spun, but he saw a purple car and just assumed that it might be Alex Bowman. And then he also thought that the white car was William Byron because I guess all white cars look the same and all purple cars look the same. That was frustrating. The only critique I'll give from the broadcast, from the camera standpoint, maybe from the producing standpoint this week, is we saw the same thing happen at Richmond. And on restarts, they love to just randomly look around or give you like this, I don't know, panoramic view, photographic view. 
something that is just not the actual restart. And that happened on one of the restarts where they come back and the cars are already very much out of the zone and almost to the flag. And it's like, we want to see the restart. We know restarts are controversial at times, especially with Denny Hamlin leading, show them. Just show the restarts. Don't, you know, like look at the fans and then cut to the cars going off into turn one. No, no, no. We want to see the restart. Some of the zooming in on the fans too. I've talked about it before. I don't need that, but they zoomed in on a couple. That Denny Hamlin fan with the Kyle Busch fan that he was tethered to, that wasn't the best. The Byron fans that left as soon as as soon as Byron wrecked out, which Byron was like, that's loyalty. And I don't disagree. Funny, but they, yeah, they just kind of hone in on a few people every race. And it's like, ah, can we get away from this? Stop letting Mitch run everything. So, yeah, at the end of the day, the, the broadcast is what it is at this point. Um, Clint and Boyer, or Clint and Boyer, <laughs> Clint and Harvick, continue to have a little bit of weird banter still back and forth speaking of harvick he will be in the hendrick motorsports number five car finally <laughs> confirmed for once over a decade after uh that guy from front stretch said that it was happening it is actually going to happen now he was just a decade ahead of his time time traveler if you will uh maybe he can play the lottery now win it since not apparently not nascar but apparently people on the r conspiracy subreddit seem to think that the lottery is a uh trap for time travelers so the government can catch them Maybe that's what Tom Bowles or whatever his NASCAR or whatever his name is from Front Stretch. Maybe it's a time traveler. Who knows? But yeah, Kevin Harvick will be the stand-in reserve driver for the number five car of Kyle Larson for the All-Star Weekend. So he will at least practice and qualify the car while Larson is, you know, attending to his Indy 500 duties. He'll also be on standby for the heat races as well as the All-Star race on Sunday night while Larson is trying to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. So for Harvick... It's a great experience. For Fox, they're going to be able to put you know, their analyst into one of the top performing cars in the Cup Series. And he'll get to work on it and kind of see what was different, different between his SHR car as well as his Hendrick car here as well. For Harvick, I think it's a great opportunity and it'll be fun, right? It's an exhibition race. Who kind of cares what, what exactly happens there? So yeah, ultimately, that's a pretty good step in the right direction for the booth. On Saturday, we had the NASCAR Xfinity Series at Dover as well, and it was easily, once again, the better race of the weekend. The Xfinity cars continue to put on an absolute show, and it's unfortunate that NASCAR just can't go to what that is for the Cup Series. It's just frustrating because it was such a great race. Ryan Truex Jr. ends up winning the race for the second year in a row. Carson Quapel looked like he was going to be the guy to get that win. Ends up finishing second. The broadcast had him scored as third. Uh, Racing Reference has him scored as second now, so we'll go with second place. Two starts in the Xfinity Series for Carson Quapel at 20 years old. Two top five finishes, including a runner-up. Should have won this race. Absolutely should have won this race. I don't get that excited watching races. I'll be honest. I like watching races. I don't get that invested in any certain driver winning. I like to see a good finish. Very rarely do I get, you know, edge of my seat like I want this guy to win. And that's exactly what happened on Saturday. Got back from doing the auction, was like, hey, before we head out to dinner, I'm going to watch the end of this Xfinity race. And I'm sitting on the edge of the bed, biting my shirt because I wanted to see Carson Quapple win. Picks the high line on the green-white checker, ends up you know, getting passed by Ryan Truex, who didn't do anything wrong. It didn't race him dirty. It was it it was racing. Carson Quapple put on an absolute clinic, though, to get himself into the lead, to set himself up for this late race restart, which we'll get to in a second. He, know, he saw the two guys in front of him racing side by side. He manages to hook the bottom, coming off a of turn four, goes three wide down the front stretch, clears them going into one and two, and clinic. A kid is 20 years old, and he looked like he had been doing this for... A decade at this point can't say enough good things about the racecraft and shout out to cars tour because they you know put out a tweet super proud of this kid and they were like cars tours where drivers come to learn racecraft or however they phrased it and they're completely right he's raced there enough he knows how to pass these guys clean he knows how to set them up at a track that he's never been to before he ran the arca race the day before finished third there uh his two arca starts i believe in his career he's finished second and third so again He knows exactly what he's doing behind the wheel of a race car. Should have picked the bottom, though. On the green-white checker prior to the one that he lost on to Ryan Truex, he's starting on the outside and Austin Hill starting on the inside. Austin Hill, who will just run into anybody now and move them out of the way. He did it just on Allgaier on Saturday. He'll do it to anyone, and apparently that's okay 
but they can't do it to him. So he goes down into turn one on the restart, fully intending to body the 88 car up the track. And the 88 just does not give a damn about Austin Hill and hugged him, just hugged that car down, took the air off the 21, 21 spins out, game over for him. And not a single person outside of Andy Petrie and Richard Childers were upset about it, which I think is absolutely hilarious. So Austin Hills met his match in Carson Quapple because Carson didn't give a damn about it, which I absolutely love to see. This race, though, great, top to bottom. Once again, the Xfinity Series absolutely delivers. Uh, Cole Custer had the dominant car of the day, 95 laps led out of the 208. So it was about 50 laps to go. NASCAR throws a caution for rain, then red flags it. So they throw the caution for rain. What they should have done was just red flag the race. Don't open pit road before you red flag it. So they open up pit road. The double zero is like, oh, I'm not going to pit because it seems like it's going to continue raining. The double zero and the seven car don't pit. Everybody behind them does pit. Then after the pit stops, NASCAR decides to throw the red flag. Hate that. Absolutely hate that. And then they come back out. And guess what? Now the seven and the double zero are screwed. Absolutely screwed through this. The race procedure should have been, if you know you're going to red flag it for rain, which you can tell that it's a pretty heavy drizzle at that point, just red flag it immediately. Don't bother opening pit road yet because you know you're not going back racing yet. I hate that they I hate that they did this. They did it back in, what was it, 2019 at the Summer Daytona race as well. Kurt Busch got screwed by and Justin Haley ends up winning the race. Yeah, I don't love it. Don't love that race procedure call at all. Screw the double zero. Screw the seven car as well. Two of the fastest cars all day end up finishing uh, fifth and 17th. So less than ideal. But the Xfinity race, like I said, once again, becomes the absolute masterclass of the weekend. The show to continue to watch. And this weekend at Kansas, it'll probably be up there with the cup race. Cup cars, especially this Gen 7 car, has raced really, really well at Kansas, so I wouldn't be shocked to see them also race really, really well again, um, but the Xfinity Series also races great at that track. Hopefully Carson Quapple and that JRM team can figure out more funding to get him in that car for additional races this year. I mean, they had nothing on the schedule after the uh, Martinsville race for him, and then what, two weeks later, he's back in the car again. So, three weeks, whatever it was. So, getting him back in the car that quickly speaks volumes has chevy on the car which means that it's backed by the chevy program it, yeah they'll find a way to get him in to a handful of more races this year hopefully he can go full time next year because the guy is a championship contender out of the box already of course he's got to learn super speedway racing of course he's got to learn road courses but at this point he has proven that he can adapt and uh yeah i think we're all going to be carson quapple fans in the future moving on to the extent or the indycar series real quick let's wrap this up IndyCar had a week filled with drama, even more Monday morning, right after, right before we were started recording this right here. It was announced that David Malukas terminated at Aero McLaren. He is out after having never started a race for the team. The team cited a clause in his contract that said if he missed more than four races in the season, he was available to be terminated. So they went ahead and terminated him. Interesting because he was just at Barber on Sunday, yesterday. With the team, did a debrief with them. He spoke to media and was like, hey, I'm hoping to be back at the Indy Road course. And then last night, he changed all of his social graphics to just dark, just black, um, removed the announcement video from his Instagram, and then this morning, the team announced that he was gone. Uh, yeah, not great. That is one of the most cutthroat teams out there. Of course, they you know, fired James Hinchcliffe uh, and decided not to renew his contract when he when it was you know Arrow SP at that point. They got rid of Oliver Askew while he was dealing with a concussion. They told Phil, Philip Rosenquist, Felix Rosenquist, not Philip, Felix Rosenquist, that if he wanted to stay with McLaren, he had to go race Formula E. And he's like, I don't want to race Formula E. Nobody wants to race Formula E at this point. It's the DTM of open wheel racing. If you've listened to Dinner with Racers, you know what I'm saying here. And then now, Malukas, gone after having never made a start for the team. <sighs> kind of knew it was going to happen, right? He was the third or fourth choice for McLaren. You knew he was on a short leash. At the end of the day, that uh, is what it is. So, yeah, Malukas out opens up a great seat now. Whether that's going to be Calum Eilat, whether that's going to be Theo Porcher, um, both of those guys have prior commitments already. Indy 500 seat is open. One of the fastest cars for the Indy 500 last year is now open for this year. Put Kyle Busch in it. As NASCAR man on Twitter said, do it. Just put him in. I would love to see it. Obviously, he had been in negotiations uh, with 
McLaren at some point last year, along with Menards, the sponsor, to get in that car, which ultimately became Kyle Larson's car uh, with that HendrickCars.com and Hendrick Motorsports collab. Let's see if it can happen. But last week, we had Joseph Newgarden and Team Penske get caught right in the middle of a cheating scandal. And yeah, they cheated. They circumvented the push-to-pass rules. Uh, they cheated at St. Pete. New Garden went up in front of the media on Friday at Barber and gave an Academy Award-winning performance. Personally, I don't believe anything that he said. Um, he said that he thought it was a the thermal rules where you could continue to push the button as much as you wanted. St. Pete happened before thermal, so I don't believe that at all. Uh, Colin Herta was asked about you know his explanation. He said it's bullshit. And I think that a lot of people are on board with that. There's a great photo from pre-race at Barber on Sunday. Joseph Newgard standing on the outside, and the rest of the drivers are all talking to each other. And it is very much like, yeah, dude, I don't think anybody's believing your excuse here. So Penske cheated. I think there's a lot of people that think that they knew that they cheated. And as much as they want to come out and say that they didn't, it's Team Penske. They're Penske perfect, right? This code had been in the car since, uh, what, August of last year, September of last year, somewhere along the lines. I don't think anybody believes what they're saying at this. But on Sunday at Barber, another driver caught up in the cheating scandal, Scott McLaughlin, who said that he only pushed it for 1.9 seconds and admitted that, like, yeah, we messed up. We shouldn't have done it. And he put out a statement before anybody else did. According to Marshall Pruitt, there was a gag order on every Team Penske employee and driver to not talk about this, and which is not out of the norm at all, but again, they still had contradicting statements from Tim Sendrick to what Joseph Newgarden said and everything involved. But Scott McLaughlin goes out there and wins pole, and then he goes out there and dominates the race. Led 58 out of the 90 laps, wins the race. He uh, gets his first win of the year. He was dead last in points, and so this certainly helps him out. Will Power, his teammate, finishes second, and Linus Lundquist drives from 12th all the way up to, or no, sorry, drives from 19th all the way up to third. His first podium in IndyCar, a uh, great result for that Chip Ganassi team as well. Felix Rosenquist uh, finishes fourth, and Alex Plo rounds out your top five. Alex Plo quietly just right there um, lurking. Will likely go on a run here sooner rather than than later. Santino Ferrucci, oh no, sorry. Christian Lungard finishes sixth, great result for him. Santino Ferrucci seventh, massive result for that AJ Foyt racing team. Colton Herta eighth, Marcus Armstrong ninth, and Kyle Kirkwood rounds out your top 10. This race had a lot of things happen in it. Not only did a mannequin fall off the crossover bridge right in front of another, in front of a car, which had to be absolutely terrifying, and then got clipped by Luca Giotto, the most obscure of obscure Dale Coyne drivers who just plucked him out of complete obscurity, put him into an Indy car this weekend. He was just sitting in Europe last weekend talking about racing. Now he is in racing. Uh, former F2 driver, former uh, endurance driver as well, current endurance driver um, for him. Stingray Rob saw that mannequin fall and uh, immediately had to go pray about it because he thought it was some sort of other doll. You know what I'm talking about. Didn't love that. He His race was also cut short because he ended up in the barriers. Pietro Fittipaldi got punted by uh, Pato Award, and Pato was like, I was a racing incident, man. It was not a racing incident. I get wanting to you know, talk your case, but come on, Pato. That wasn't even anywhere close to that. You also had um, Christian uh, Rasmussen spins out again. I think the kids got talent, but man, back-to-back -back bad races for him. Theo Porcher finishes 22nd. Did not have as great of a run that he had at Long Beach uh, last weekend. So we'll see if he'll be back in that car now that we know David Malukas is gone. But for the most part, this was a really good race, top to bottom. You have three drivers lead 10 laps or more. Santino Ferrucci out front for a lot of this, not a lot of this, but 14 laps of this race as they worked pit strategy. And then you also had uh, Alex Polo lead 12 laps, uh, Linus Lundquist lead four, Will Power one, and Felix Rosenquist one as well. This race is good, top to bottom. IndyCar continues to be one of the best series out there. Uh, great passing, great racing, great hard, hard nose, side by side racing, which I think we all love to see any chance we can get. But IndyCar just continues to be marred by <laughs> drama surrounding it. 100 Days to Indy did not talk about it on Friday night. That kind of bummed me out. Uh, it was very much a Joseph Newgarden-centric episode. This has kind of turned into what feels like the 100 Days with Joseph Newgarden now. So hopefully we get some more drivers worked in here. But the Newgardens are something. 
There's something. So let me know in the comments what you thought about the racing this weekend. I will get back to everybody that reached out about doing some sort of co-hosting thing. Probably just do like a rotating cast maybe at some point and just see, you know, what works best. We'll figure it out. But like and subscribe to the channel. Follow me on TikTok at Break Hard, Instagram and Twitter at Break Hard Blog.